Hello students, good afternoon, a very warm welcome to all of you, myself Ashay Kumar, the faculty and mentor for history, your teacher for history and today we are going to discuss a very exciting and engaging session with regards to a very important topic in our study of Indian history ok and this uh, topic or this section is called as a medieval India. So, as everyone knows that Indian history is divided into three parts, ancient Indian history, the medieval Indian history and the modern Indian history and to understand the process of the whole history that is from ancient to modern, right? the medieval Indian history is very very crucial right? to understand the very process from ancient to the modern Indian history or from beginning of the Indian history to the latest that is India's independence in 1947, the main link or main chain is a medieval Indian history and I know that all of you are very curious to know much more about medieval Indian history ok because since ancient history is very uh, goes back to very long time. So, since it is very ancient okay, as the name suggests, at least we get to know something about it okay, out of our curiosity. Then since the modern history is very latest, again we focus our attention to understand the various aspects of the modern Indian history. But the very medieval Indian history okay, which lies in between, okay, which lies in between and which actually balances both aspects of the history. Many times we are not able to exactly know what exactly happened during that middle period as far as the Indian history are concerned. Okay? We do not know exactly what happened during that middle period as far as the Indian history is concerned. So, that is what I would like to uh, unveil the cover. Okay? I would like to get aside the whole uh, cover as far as the medieval Indian history is concerned and I will let you know the very rich and dynamic aspects of our history, our rich past during the medieval era. So, before beginning anything, okay, we should know. So, what exactly is the era known as medieval era or a medieval India? Okay? So, you will see that era which basically begins from around 8th century AD to 18th century AD, okay, era which normally begins from around 8th century AD to the 18th century AD, that era is called as a medieval era or a era of a medieval Indian history, roughly 1000 years which is a very long time okay. and earlier the focus normally used to be on ancient history and modern history. Of course, the focus was there on medieval history also, but yet much more was yet to get, much, much more was yet to know to all of us. So, fortunately in the last few years okay, and especially after the independence of India, we have many more dynamic aspects, very interesting facts, okay, a very critical analysis of the different aspects of the middle period that is from 8th century AD to 18th century AD and that is what is exactly called as a medieval history. So, now we will start about understanding and we will start about building our basic blocks. Okay? We will start understanding and building our basic blocks as far as the middle period or a medieval history of India is concerned. A very, very, very interesting topic. And I also know that all of you are very, very curious. I also know that all of you are very, very curious to know okay, what exactly lies in the treasure of medieval India. Okay? That all of you are also very curious to know that what exactly lies in the treasure called as a medieval India. Okay? So, now I will tell you one by one, one by one that how basically the things were happening and the events were taking place in this medieval Indian history okay? and definitely we will start from around this 7th to 8th century only. 
when the different changes were being witnessed both in the context of North India and also in the context of the South India. Right? Because we are dealing with the history of India as a whole. So, we should get to know what exactly was happening during this period okay? as far as North and South India is concerned. And today, today especially we are going to focus, okay? today especially we are going to focus on the early part of medieval history. Okay? We are going to deal with early medieval Indian history okay? that is from around 7th to 8th century AD till up to 12th century AD. Okay? That period of the medieval Indian history is called as a early medieval Indian history. So, we will have the two parts of the medieval history. So, first of our learning objective for today's class is that or first of our learning objective for today's discussion is that that we have to understand that how the medieval Indian history is divided, okay? how in how many parts it is divided. So, broadly we will see there are two divisions, okay? there are two divisions as far as the medieval history is concerned. And we are dealing in an Indian context. We are dealing in an Indian context. So, first is about early medieval Indian history. And then as I mentioned, second part will be the late medieval history. Okay. And as I am discussing, okay, as I am discussing, that early part of the medieval Indian history, it will basically cover the time frame from around 750 AD okay, till uh, we can say at the end of 12th century AD. Okay. So, almost 500 years or so will be covered as far as this early medieval history of India is concerned. This is also called as an era. This is also called as an era known as a pre invasion period okay? or pre Turkish period. Okay. Of course, I will also discuss that. Even though it is a pre Turkish invasion period, and we also have to discuss about what exactly is a Turkish invasion, right? What exactly is a Turkish invasion? That also we have to discuss. But the point is that even though it is a pre Turkish invasion period, that does not mean that there was no Turkish invasion as such, right? that there was no Turkish invasion as such. It is not exactly the case. You will find that Turkish invasions had started, right? But by and large, this era was dominated by Rajput. Okay. By and large, this era was dominated by Rajput kingdoms. Okay. One warrior community and its rise will be witnessed in India. One warrior community and its rise will be witnessed in India. Okay. And that community will be called as a Rajput community. That community is called as a Rajput community. And definitely, and definitely, we will discuss today about that Rajput community okay, and the so-called Rajput kingdoms. So this is exactly what the early medieval India is. We can find, okay. And then we have second half that is late medieval India, which will start from around 13th century, and it will last up to 18th century. Okay. And this is a medieval India where you will find, okay the Turkish rulers, you will find Turkish rulers okay. and we have two Turkish empire, we have two Turkish empires known as Delhi Sultanate and then we have the Mughal empire. Okay. In that late medieval Indian history, we will find that there will be two Turkish empires because as I have told you, this was an era which goes back to pre-Turkish invasion period. This is an era, early medieval Indian era is an era which goes back to pre-Turkish invasion period. Now, you will see by this era, there is a late medieval era, Turkish, 
kingdoms will emerge the turks who have came from outside india they got firmly established in india okay? and then you will see the first turkish empire known as the delhi sultanate and when this empire declined another turkish race came in india with a name uh, which bears the title of mughals and this becomes the mughal empire so in this is what broadly the scenario is as far as our medieval indian history is concerned and of course we also have to keep in mind the history of india as a whole and the medieval indian history in particular it is not an history just to uh, take into account the name of the kings it is not an history just to know the kingdoms it is not an history just to know the battles but we have to see how the various socio cultural processes how the various religious developments took place in india see how the rulers both the indian rulers as well as those who came from outside or so called foreign rulers how they basically ruled what were the achievements eh, as far as these rulers were concerned and what exactly eh, what exactly basically was the process through which the society culture economy the administrative aspects of india everything was shaped up eh, that means the whole indian society the whole indian uh, economy eh, it was shaped up by the various developments which were taking place during this period okay so this point also is very very crucial for us to build our knowledge the very basic knowledge or a foundational knowledge as far as the medieval indian history is concerned okay now we can see what we have to take into account okay so as i have told you that we are going to deal today with the overview okay as far as what was the scenario in north india what was the scenario in north india when the medieval india started okay so we have to first uh, keep in mind and first we have to understand exactly that what was the scenario in north india when basically the medieval india started so in case of early medieval india okay in case of early medieval india it is north india we will find we will find this map and my friends always keep in mind okay, that whenever you are understanding the history whenever you are learning the history okay, without map you cannot understand or learn the history properly if you want to learn the history if you want to enjoy the history Okay. and if you want to basically understand the historical process properly then you have to keep in mind that map is very very important you must have heard this adage that a picture speaks for a thousand words okay. you must have heard this adage that a picture speaks for a thousand words so this is what exactly will give us an insights okay. this is what exactly will give us an insights that how exactly was a north india in a time or time frame of 750 ad to 12 century ad okay what exactly was a scenario in north india from 750 ad to 12 century ad <coughs> and as i have mentioned this era is of course you can see here this map is showing the india in 1050 ad okay so one particular mark or a landmark of this whole early medieval india okay one particular landmark year or a kind of the so called stage has been taken okay, whereby you can just understand how india was during the time of early medieval india okay, so 1050 ad has been taken okay, as a midpoint okay, as far as this indian history is concerned and of course this map is showing the political history or the so called kingdoms which were there in north india and also in decca plus south india also in deccan plus south india so first we will focus upon the kingdoms which were there in north india so you can easily see here okay, 
as i have mentioned this is an era known as a era for rajput kingdoms yeah, this is an era which is known as a era for rajput kingdoms so first thing and the first curious question okay, which will come to the mind of everyone okay, all of you will ask this question so sir what exactly is meant by the term rajput you will ask but what exactly is meant by the term rajput so the point is that or the answer is that rajput basically is a community okay? and rajput basically is a community of a people who belong or who belong to a particular race and ethnicity okay? rajput basically is a community of people who belong to specific race and ethnicity okay? community of the specific race and ethnicity as far as the people are concerned so what exactly is the case just briefly i will i will give you the highlight okay just briefly i will give you the highlight so as you can see in the map here the whole uh, red line is representing okay, the rajput kingdoms of early medieval india and now i am sure that everyone has got the idea what exactly is a early medieval india and what is the timeline as far as the early medieval indian history is concerned of course i will like to tell you that we don't have to remember any year okay? we don't have to remember any year we just have to understand the sequence if the years or centuries are given they are given only to understand the sequence of the indian history okay so just like we have a facebook timeline similarly indian history also has its own timeline okay so years are not important the whole era and the sequence of important events in that era okay the whole era and the sequence of important events in that era is important so since more and less this is a rajput era so that's why first we have to understand in a north indian context that who are rajput means if you, if you observe this map what you will get to know you will get to know that rajputs are there as a community and this community built their kingdoms only in a north and a part of central india okay so rajput kingdoms rajput as a community of a particular race and ethnicity is found only in a north and central india we don't found uh, we don't find the rajputs okay, as far as the uh, deccan and south india is concerned okay the map of deccan and south india i have with uh, in a separate slide and that map that map will uh, make it very clear that map will make it very clear that what was exactly a scenario in deccan and south india so that we will see little later but first we will get to know that what exactly are the rajput kingdoms and what is the term rajput so as i have mentioned these are the peoples who belong to particular ethnicity and race so there are different uh, views among the historians okay so, so i will just give a brief highlight for our basic understanding that how the rajput originated so there are different views about the origin of the rajputs first origin is about the so called ancient kshatriya heroes okay so according to one view or according to one set of historians rajput originated from ancient kshatriya heroes like Ra lord rama of ramayana and like arjuna of mahabharata so this is a first view that the rajput basically they are like a descendants uh, or they are like a uh, we can having the origin from lord rama or from arjuna of the mahabharata okay so those rajput who claim their origin okay, from the legendary lord rama they are called as a uh, we can say surya vamshi uh, they are called as a surya vamshi rajput why because lord rama belonged to that dynasty which was called as a 
Surya Vamshi dynasty. Lord Rama belonged to the dynasty called as a Surya Vamshi dynasty. Okay? And those Rajput who claim their origins from Maharatha heroes, those Rajputs who claim their origins from Maharatha heroes, so they are called as a Chandra Vamshi. They are called as a Chandra Vamshi. So, the Mahabharata heroes like Pandavas, they used to claim their origin from uh, the so called uh, moon. Okay? They had their origin from moon. And Lord Rama and his dynasty, they used to claim their origin from sun. That is why Rajput basically, they also claim their origin from sun as well as moon. Then, according to one more view, Rajput are foreigners. Okay? So, According to one view, the Rajputs have the foreign origin. So, just before this medieval era started, and then ancient era was coming to an end, and I will tell you about that also. Okay. So, at that time, there were certain foreign invasions, certain foreign races and tribes invaded India, and pre premier among them were the tribe of Gurjaras, and the tribe of Hunus, okay. the tribe of Gurjaras, and the tribe of Hunus, and that is why. The Rajput basically, according to certain set of historians, okay, they basically uh, normally have the claim that Rajput have the foreign origin. From these foreign invading tribes of the ancient India, Rajputs uh, saw their rise in a early medieval India. Okay? And you will see there is one uh, hist uh, historian known as J James Todd. Okay? There is one historian known as James Todd, okay? he basically gave this view about the foreign origin of the Rajput. Then we have one more view about origin okay? and this view is called as a so called Agnikula Rajput theory. Okay? This view basically talks about the so called Agnikula Rajput theory. So, according to this Agnikula Rajput theory, what we will witness? This view basically uh, has a uh, sound backing uh, by a text called as Prithviraj Raso. Okay. So, we will see. There was one famous poet okay, known as Chand Bardai, who belonged to around 12th century AD. He wrote the famous poetic work Prithviraj Raso. Okay. And in this poetic work Prithviraj Raso, what we will witness that he has mentioned about the sacrificial fire pit origin of the Rajput. So, according to him, the Rajputs basically originated from a sacrificial fire. Okay. A big sacrifice was conducted near Mount Abu. Okay? A big sacrifice was conducted near Mount Abu, okay? which is a place in Rajasthan. Okay? Somewhere here you will find the Mount Abu is there. Okay? So, in a very long period of time, okay, this sacrifice was conducted as far as the Mount Abu is concerned. And out of that sacrificial pit, Okay. Certain Rajput families originated. Okay. Certain Rajput families originated. So, the prominent Rajput families who claim their origin from this sacrificial pit, okay, as far as the Mount Abu is concerned, they are called as Parmar, okay. they are called as Chalukya, they are called as Chavana. And they also are called as a Pratihara. Okay? So, this Pratihara dynasty of the Rajputs, Chavana dynasty of the Rajput, the Chalukya dynasty of the Rajput, okay? and the Parmar dynasty of the Rajput, they basically claim their origin okay? as far as this sacrificial fire or Agnikula is concerned. So, accordingly, you will see we have both the mythical origin of the Rajput also. We have the so called legendary or a proto historic origin of the Rajputs also, 
going back to Mahabharata Ramayana period, and we also have the a uh, very foreign origin of the Rajputs also. Okay. According to one more set of historians, Rajputs even had an origin within India. Okay. So some of the historians they are of the view that Rajput did not come from outside. They are a part and parcel of the very Indian subcontinent. Okay. This is also one of the origins as far as the Rajput is concerned. So what is the point? So when these Rajput kingdoms emerge, so how they emerge? First of all. Whatever may be the different viewpoints about this origin of the Rajputs, but the fact is that Rajput as a community originated. Okay. What is the fact that Rajput as a community originated? And what is more established fact is that Rajput is a warrior community. Rajput is a warrior community. Okay. So this point we have to keep in mind, and we also have to keep in mind. That normally when the Rajput ori had their origin or they witnessed their rise, okay? so this is a time frame or this is a starting point or a beginning point as far as this early medi medieval Indian history is concerned. Because the very rise and the origin of the Rajput, okay? it acts like a transition phase when ancient uh, period of the Indian history was coming to an end. The very origin of the Rajput and their rise is basically like a transition phase when the ancient period of the Indian history was coming to an end and India was witnessing the socio economic as well as political transformation. Okay? India was witnessing socio economic and political transformation and even the cultural transformation. Okay? This is very important. Okay? Socio economic. Okay? cultural and political transformation. Okay. Was being witnessed in India uh, as far as the end of ancient India is concerned and the start of medieval India is concerned. Okay. The end of ancient India is concerned. And start of medieval India. So this is a very crucial point and this point we have to always keep in mind, we have to fit that uh, aspect into our mind as a part of our understanding process. Okay. Why? Because normally many times you will see, many, many times even many people will teach and they will say that when the so called Hindu kingdoms ended and the Muslim invasions started the medieval India starts, okay. ancient India will come to an end when the Hindu kingdoms came to an end and when the Muslim invasion started from outside India, okay, the medieval India starts. This is a we can say very falsified view, okay. this is a very falsified view as far as Indian history is concerned. So simple understanding of change from ancient to medieval India is that as I have mentioned, when the social and economic processes when the cultural uh, dimensions and the cultural aspects and when the political systems okay, and along with that administrative systems, political systems and administrative systems they are together. Okay. So when this socio-economic, <coughs> cultural and political aspects or a administrative aspect witness a transformation okay, as a part of a process, then we can say the India also witnessed a shift from ancient history to the medieval history. Okay. India also witnessed a shift from an ancient history to a medieval history. So, in North India, if you see, Emperor Harshavardhan, he was the last great emperor of India as far as the ancient history is concerned. Okay. So, how this transition happened, now I am telling you. So, how this transition happened, I am now telling you. Okay. And I am sure that you have the whole understanding now how the changes were taking place, how the process of the history was evolving. Okay? History is always about the change but with a continuity. Many things change because of the time, because his history is like a time machine. Okay? History is like a time machine from beginning to end. Okay? And that is why change always takes place. But yet you will find there is also consistency. 
Okay, yet you will find there is always a consistency in the form of continuity. Despite many changes, you will find certain things are as it is, they do not change. Okay? So, this is what the history uh, is all about and especially in the context of India. And this is how we have to develop our understanding, we have to build our blocks okay, to understand the history. So, the point is that as I am mentioning, Emperor Harshavardhan He was the last great emperor of ancient India okay? and especially in North India. He was the last great emperor in ancient India and uh, when we look, when we take a look at the North India okay? and Ula okay? Kesin too. He was the last great emperor okay, as far as the Deccan and the South India was concerned. Okay. When we take a look at Deccan and South India, Ulla II, he was the last great emperor as far as Deccan and South India is concerned. And this Ulla II, this Ulla II, he belonged to this dynasty that is Chalukya dynasty. This Ulakis in second, he belonged to Chalukya dynasty. So, the point is that roughly when both these great rulers of North and South they died, okay, there was a political instability. Okay, there was a political instability in India, okay, especially in North India, at least in South India, even after the death of Ulakis in second, okay, in the case of Deccan in South India, even after the death of Ulakis in second. Uh, there were other rulers who were able to maintain the kingdoms in Deccan and South India. Okay? There were other wars, rulers who were able to maintain their kingdoms in Deccan and South India. But if you see the North India especially, then North India fell into political chaos. And North India fell into political chaos as far as the death of Harishavardhan is concerned. And there was a transition phase of around a century. Okay? There was a transition phase of around a century. Okay? Okay? So, from around 650 AD uh, to that 750 AD, this was like a period of a century where you will see that political chaos were there in North India. Why? Because there was no strong empire, okay? there was no strong empire in North India. The whole North India now started to get divided into small principalities. The whole North India started to get divided into small principalities and small kingdoms. And these small kingdoms, they were weak. They did not have a strong rulers. They did not have a strong political systems. They did not have a sound financial and revenue resources. What I said, I will repeat. These all small kingdoms which were emerging as far as the North India is concerned, we witness that they did not have the strong rulers. They, we will also see that they did not have the financial resources and they also did not have a strong system of government and administration. And that is why they themselves were weak and none of them was in a position to defend India against any kind of attack we may have. Okay? None of them was uh, very uh, efficient and very strong to defend India from any kind of attack okay, which India may witness. So, this point we have to keep in mind. And in this so called century of 650 to 750 AD, okay, we will see the Rajputs have their origin. Okay? The Rajput witness their origins. Okay? So, out of these small principalities only, you will see that as a part of great social intermixture, as a part of great social and cultural intermixture as far as Indian society was concerned, okay, origin of the Rajputs was witness. Origin of Rajputs was witness. Okay. And then you will see, once this origin of the Rajputs was witness, then we will see that the different Rajput families emerge. 
So whatever Rajput kingdoms we are witnessing here, so we can say we have Chavanas, we have Parmar, we have Solanki, we have Gadwal, we have Tomars, we have Chandil, we have Pratihara. Okay? So we will see that all these Rajput kingdoms, they were like a families, they were like a dynasties and they got established themselves in a different parts of North and Central India. Okay? They got established themselves in a different parts of North and Central India and gradually they started to become strong. Okay? Gradually they started becoming strong. But the point was that none of them could become completely strong okay? because as I have told you, Rajput community as a whole, it was a warrior risk. The Rajput community as a whole, it was a warrior race and these dynasties and the kingdoms which emerged, they belong to one single race only. Yet, despite belonging to one single race, they had differences among them. Right? They had their own social differences, they had their own cultural differences. Okay? And what we will see, all of them, despite being Kshatriya, okay? they also got divided into the caste structure of India. Okay? The so called Rajput, they also got divided into the caste structures of India. Okay? And that is why you will see, that is why you will see that these Rajputs, okay? these Rajputs, despite being a warrior class and despite being uh, very strong individually also, they could not pose any kind of unity. Right? They could not pose any kind of unity as far as the foreign invaders were concerned. So we will see that this whole era from 750 AD to 12th century AD, this is an era for Rajputs, for 450 years of Rajput era. Right? And we saw many strong kingdoms and many, many strong individual rulers. Like example, the so called Gurjara Pratyara dynasty. At one point of time, it was the strongest dynasty in whole of North India. Okay? And Nagabatta first, Nagabatta first, he was a founder as far as his dynasty was concerned. Okay? And you will see, it this dynasty, it basically was able to defend India from foreign invasions. Okay? When Arabs were invading India, okay? when Arabs were invading India, the so-called Gurjara Pratihara dynasty, it defended India. Yet you will see, despite the fact that this dynasty was strong okay, and it created a strong kingdom, but still we will see once this dynasty started declining, okay, once this dynasty started declining, India could not witness okay, the same kind of defense which was necessary against the invading tribes like Arabs okay, and the Turks who were uh, consistently attacking India. Okay? The Gurjara Pratyara dynasty was like one exception. And after Gurjara Pratyara dynasties, you will see this, so many dynasties came. Okay? After the Gurjara Pratyara dynasty, you will see so many dynasties came. And unfortunately, all of them were fighting among themselves. Unfortunately, all of them were fighting among themselves. And since all of them were fighting among themselves, okay? so all of them became weak. Because everyone knows, united we stand and divided we fall. Okay? United we stand and divided we fall. So, if ultimately the foreign invaders like Arabs and Turks came to India, okay? if ultimately the foreign invaders like Arabs and Turks they came to India, that was mainly because despite Rajput being a very powerful class, okay? despite Rajput being a very, very powerful ruling class, they could not unite among themselves. They were they were divided by their own egos. Okay? They were divided by castes. Okay? Despite belonging to a Kshatriya class as a whole, okay? the Rajput society was divided into class a uh, caste. And as such, other caste or people of other caste, they were not basically allowed to be a part as far as the warfare was concerned. And that's why the Rajputs could not even get a support of their own people right? because of the caste issues. And individually also you will see all these Rajput kingdoms, they were fighting among themselves. Because all of them was having the single objective that 
who will rule the whole north india right out of us who will rule the whole north india that was a single objective they had and that's why despite having a con consistent foreign invasions right and the foreign invasions were coming from here foreign invasions they were coming from here right and despite having a consistent foreign invasions we will see none of the rajputs right none of the rajput kingdoms that was able to rise up to a defense as far as india was concerned right none of the rajput kingdom was uh, possible possibly rise to the defense right? as far as india was concerned and because of that you will see the historical transformation of india took place because of that you will see the historical transformation of india took place okay? of course these rajput kingdoms they also have their own positives okay? they have their uh, unique cultural contribution in the terms of temples okay? in the terms of development of architecture in terms of development of poetic works the linguistic developments of india okay? the great poets and so on still you will see society as a whole political system as a whole okay? economic development as a whole these rajput kingdoms could not give a stability to india right? these rajput kingdoms could not give a stability to india and the end result was that india witnessed the foreign invasions and as we will see later the very called turkish era will be established okay? and the turkish invaders they will establish the big empires as far as india is concerned so in that fashion basically this is a very interesting uh look out as to how india was being transformed how the events were taking shape how the things were changing as far as the transition from ancient to medieval india is concerned and this transition phase of early medieval india is very very crucial to us for our basic understanding and building blocks to have the sound mastery and knowledge over the medieval india so my friends i am definitely sure that you must have enjoyed the today's session okay? and because you also have uh, a very strong and uh, a uh, zeal for understanding and knowing that history that curiosity okay? so always definitely you should maintain this curiosity as history is the knowledge of our past and we can change our future and even change our current or present situations okay? by understanding the history so on this note i will take to take to leave uh, to, i will take the leave of all of you and again we will meet in the next exciting session to discuss the further important and interesting topic till then goodbye and have a good day a good weekend thank you very much